talk about the best way to activate muscles that may be weaker than others or activate muscles that may be weak links for you. There is no better method. Yeah. If you want to activate your glutes because they don't develop when you do well, squats, isometrics. You want to activate your chest because it's not developing like your shoulders and triceps, isometrics. It's a phenomenal training method that nobody uses ever, ever. And so it's this is something that's very this is what this is one of the answers to this problem. And in terms of programming, start your workouts off with them or do entire cycles. I suggest people try a two or three week cycle of isometric training and then go back to your training and see what happens. Oh boy, this giveaway is exciting. We released a brand new MAPS program, MAPS Symmetry, and one of you is gonna get it for free. Symmetry and balance. They are essential for a body that looks amazing and moves well. When your body and movement are symmetrical, risks of injury are lower and your ability to build muscle, gain real world strength and boost metabolism is greatly improved. Now MAPS Symmetry is a full workout program designed specifically to help you build a body that moves in a balanced way. It helps you bring up weak or lagging body parts and it helps you shatter previous plateaus. Is your bench press, squat or deadlift stuck at the same weight it's been at for months or even years? If so, MAPS Symmetry can get things progressing again. Has your body stopped building muscle? Map Symmetry's unique approach is likely going to get you to new levels. Now, Map Symmetry is an 11 week full workout program complete with sets, reps, exercises, and video demos. With Map Symmetry, you will get everything you need to help you achieve new levels with your body and performance. Map Symmetry focuses on unilateral exercises, meaning you train each side of your body independently, but it also incorporates a pure strength phase at the end of the program so you can see just how far you've progressed. If you want a body that looks balanced, symmetrical, and is free of pain and imbalances, get started with MAP Symmetry today by clicking the button below. Also, it comes with a full 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can actually try the program for a full month, and if you don't like it, return it for a full refund. This is a program designed to develop balance and symmetry in your body. Unilateral training, isometrics, and 5x5 five five strength building training. It's a brand new MAPS program. Brand new. We're launching it right now. And one of you is going to get it for free. And you're going to get two free eBooks. We also have created two eBooks for free. One of them, or for you, one of them is Reverse Dieting 101. And one of them is an Isometrics eBook. So one of them teaches you how to reverse diet. One of them teaches you all about isometrics, their value, and the studies. So here's how you can win free access to MAPS Symmetry and get free access to those two eBooks. Leave a comment below. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. Say something cool. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If you do all those things and if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get them all for free. Now, everyone else, this is the launch of Maps Symmetry. It's going to retail for $177 and each of those eBooks are going to retail for $47 each. But because this is a launch, it's on sale right now at discount for the next seven days. So this promotion is going to end next Sunday. So you can get Map Symmetry and you get the two eBooks for $97. Okay, so one-time payment, $97, and you get all of it, the eBooks and the program. All you got to do is go to mapsymmetry.com and then use the code SYM50 for the discount. All right, here comes the show. You know what's interesting is when you look at studies of what people consider um, eye-appealing or attractive, first off... Typically what we find something that looks good, there's a connection to better health or better physical performance. Or whatever. There's roots to it, right? Evolutionary roots. But here's what's, what's interesting. If you look at standards across the world, and they've done studies on this, there's not a lot of commonalities. There, there definitely is an eye is in the, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder type of thing going on. Yeah. But there are some consistencies and one consistency across the world is symmetry. Yeah. Have you ever seen how, especially with faces? Too, yes. I've seen those studies, and uh, and you see this in in ancient uh, sculptures as well. Like, yes, they stand out when they get it just right. When it's like perfectly symmetrical, it really stands There's out. There's a mathematical equation for it for for beauty. 
I've oh. seen it before, oh. and, it, and it, is, it has to do with the symmetry, yes. how the distance between the eyes, the nose to the lips, the all of it. Yeah, well, symmetry in particular just means uh, each side matches uh, perfectly. Well, now, and that's really what it is. It's yeah. like that's the, the mathematical equation is how even even everything is separated from each other is the they quote unquote would define would define. Yeah. Beauty. So what they do when they find these commonalities is they say, okay, how does this connect to health? Like, what does this mean? Why is this this universal attraction to this particular trait. Well, one is it, it demonstrates healthy genes. So um, lots of asymmetry means there's some genetic, typically means there's some genetic issues uh, going on. So that's on the extreme end, right? But we also find symmetry attractive in muscular development, uh, movement. When we look at movement and consider yeah. movement to be uh, beautiful or flowing or attractive versus movement that maybe looks clunky or not so attractive, what you typically find are irregularities or asymmetries. Uh, symmetry is very important for athletic performance. So when you're doing an explosive movement or running or twisting and you have a discrepancy between one side or the other, now there are sports where asymmetries are part of the, I guess, part of the formula. Like if you're a pitcher, right? Or if you always swing in one direction, you start to find asymmetries. But for the most part, if one leg pushes off at 2%, more power than the other leg when I'm running, my body has to compensate. And usually what it does is it doesn't reduce all my power by 2%. There's a larger decrease to buffer against things like injury, right? So there's a big reason why symmetry is so attractive and it's because it's connected to health and connected to performance. And then to bodybuilding, for example, bodybuilding, not necessarily a sport we would consider to healthy, but the judging criteria is based off of, you know, what people would label as aesthetics or how good someone looks. And I know it's extreme now, but those are all extreme versions of some root truth. And one of the number one things that, that bodybuilders and physique competitors and bikini competitors get judged on is symmetry. You have to have really good symmetry and lots of really huge, muscular, ripped, shredded looking people will lose to other people who have superior symmetry because it just mean, doesn't look as good. I mean, that's an, it, it is an extreme analogy, but the truth is it's a great way to highlight your point. Um, and I remember firsthand, like, seeing this, it would be, you'd see somebody backstage and they'd have, like, you know, just this massive, impressive chest or, like, just the biggest shoulders you've ever seen. And initially you think, like, oh, because he's got this muscle that is, like, so pronounced or like you know bigger than you've ever seen before he's probably going to do really good in the show and many times i would see those guys not even place very well and you don't notice it until you're sitting kind of out uh, like where the judges are and looking up at stage and you're comparing all the physiques and a guy that would be much smaller than than mm -hmm. this guy would play so much better but it's because it was more uh like uh, appealing to the eye yeah. like you just having seeing a balanced physique looks better than overly impressive individual muscles. It's just, it looks better. And yeah. it's, it's, and it's, I know it's subjective, but it's really, it's a, well, it's, there's a reason why something looks better. Now we've distorted it, uh, because obviously in modern times we distort everything that we find, mm -hmm. uh, to be attractive, but you know, you mentioned balance and I, and I want to talk about balance because in bodybuilding balance refers to like, does your upper body match the lower body? Does the chest match the back? Symmetry would be right to left. But in reality, in the real world, balance and symmetry are kind of the same thing, right? Do you like, for example, if you could gain 20 pounds on your upper body, but lose 10 pounds on your legs or, you know, or keep your legs the way they are or vice versa, you know, most people wouldn't want to do something like that because it just wouldn't make them look good. Maybe they think, yeah, it would. But when you see that in real life, it just doesn't look as good. And then if you, have you guys ever noticed, like uh, you ever watch somebody who maybe standing still looks impressive, but then they start to move. And you know, I don't know what words we use to describe it, like awkward or clunky. Mm -hmm. There's not symmetrical it's movement. Off, yes, right. yes. Yeah, well, that the point in terms of like from a performance perspective, if I'm a competitor, I'm looking for the side they favor. I'm looking for the tendencies. I'm looking for the patterns. And it's very visibly obvious, especially for the competitors, not so much um, the athlete that's actually displaying those skills because – uh, a lot, we just fall into our our strengths, our, our patterns, where our go to uh, that we're hardwired, um, you know, to to basically like uh, you know lean upon, and so we all have sort of this 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 slight discrepancy that we're always trying to reconcile. But when it's like 
you know, very much more extreme or obvious, it definitely takes away from your performance on the field. Were there examples of that that you remember, like in like in basketball, right? So in football for you, but in basketball, so <laughs> yes, um, it would be great. You play in a new team, you've never played them before, and right away, like one of the things that you communicate to your your other teammates when you see it is a is a guy that favors oh, his yeah. his left hand These over his reads. yeah, because then you completely shift the way you defend yeah. them because you know they favor that side so much that going the other direction is awkward, uncomfortable, and, and it's not, so it's a disadvantage. Yeah. So a lot of times you, you almost completely open up and give them mm -hmm. their side. You know, they're less dominant and you shut off the other side so that you really funnel them in the direction that you know that they're yeah. less dominant. Well, you, it, yeah, you can bring up all kinds of different sport examples. I mean, just for football, we look and break down film, especially with the running backs and say, I'm looking at it from a perspective mm. of, of a linebacker where I'm looking at how heavy they are in their hand, you know, how heavy they are to one side, if their shoulders shift a bit, um, you know, what their first step usually consists of uh you know how they rotate their body like it, all these things are tells for me to then plan and strategize like my next move yeah you know in boxing there's there, there's even boxers that won't won't fight southpaws because they just it, it throws everything off for them because they're so good at fighting people who are right-handed yep in jiu-jitsu i lost the tournament because i you know at the level i got to when you get to a really good level you develop lots of symmetry you're able to pass the guard on both sides, defend both sides very well. But up until that point, you get really good on one side and you're kind of good on the other side, but there's a discrepancy. So what happened to me, I got attacked on an on a side that I rarely ever get attacked on and uh, threw me off and I totally lost. Mm -hmm. But even beyond that, right? Even beyond the, the, the strategies, just having, like, you know, here's the thing. Like when you work out a lot with barbells and barbells are, are amazing because they build lots of strength, lots of muscle, but if you're off just a little bit, if your right arm is pushing 2% more than your left arm, you're not going to notice on the lift. You're not going to see it. Like if I press up, unless it's obvious, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to tell. Even hard, It's even hard for really experienced coaches. Like I can, I'd have to look at someone and really pay attention to notice those small differences. If it's glaring, it's obvious, but sometimes it's really hard to see. And what ends up happening is, okay, if I do that exercise once, not a big deal. But if I train that way for years and years and years, it starts to I start to develop bigger and bigger imbalances. It, it, uh, you know, injury risk goes up quite a bit. I don't develop my body to its full potential because what happens is my body, in order to protect itself, doesn't just limit the arm that's stronger so that it matches the other arm. It doesn't teach the other arm to push harder. It limits everything beyond that because it has to create a buffer. And so you're actually never able to reach your full potential because of a one or two percent difference. And I use a small percentage. It's usually more like five to ten percent. Do you guys remember when you first experienced this as a lifter yourself? Like I, I think this. I think everybody has this. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at, in some more extreme than others. Um, but I remember first getting into lifting, and when I would bench, uh, my my left side. So my shoulder on my left side would, would, would act, no, it would roll forward a little oh. bit. So it would, it would, I would, I would roll this forward and put, and I'm exaggerating for, so for people can see on the, on the, on the camera or whatever, but I would, I would roll this shoulder forward. And so it would yeah. cause the bar to lift faster on the left side and it would dip, it would be dipped and lagging on the right side. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of it and I would just, I would try and just mentally try and fix it. But the, the problem was the way I was, I was unable to keep my shoulder in a retracted position on that mm -hmm. left side at this time. I'm, I'm so young. I'm like, you know, this is me at 17, 18, 19 years old. And so I'm not like, I, I don't have a good understanding of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, any of that stuff yet. I'm still, I'm still learning all this stuff. So you had your friend push on the other side. Yeah. So I had a friend like hold it down. And, but you know, I really, I really, I was aware of it, but I pretty much didn't do anything to correct it and fix it. So I trained for years that way. Well, when I got to be in my early twenties, I was I was very insecure about my chest because it was totally visible. Yeah, I had developed mm. the right side way more because my form was strict and right on on the right side because I stayed retracted. The side that I was rolling forward and pushing up faster, I was getting more development in my shoulder and I, my chest was really weak. So you could literally see a difference. Now it took years of me just kind of like thinking I was working at it or ignoring it. And before I really noticed a, a physical difference. Two things I want to comment on that. One is when you have a visible difference in symmetry or balance, like my quads way overpower my glutes or my biceps don't balance out with my triceps or my chest and my back or right to left, like you said, Adam, 
by the time you have a visual difference, yeah, your way. the functional difference has already been there for a long time. Yeah. It doesn't show up visually in, until the functional difference has been trained for a long time. And the second thing, and this is why I said your friend pushed your shoulder down, because I've heard you tell that story before. Oftentimes we try to fix imbalances through force. What actually happened when one shoulder rolled forward and your friends pushed down on it is you actually added resistance to the shitty form. You actually made the imbalance worse. I remember doing this with clients as an early trainer, not knowing any better. Like I had client, like a client who was squatting and her knees, her, or excuse me, her knees would cave in. So what I did is I put a medicine ball between her knees so they wouldn't cave in. But all that does is it provides something for her to push her knees right. against. Squeeze in more. And actually, yeah. so it corrected the form the way it looked while she was doing it because the ball was there. But in reality, I was actually making that imbalance worse. What I should have yeah. done is put bands You're around her knees, forcing it, have her push in the opposite direction, right? Exactly. So I noticed it for myself, Adam, when I did dumbbell training. So when I started working out and I started really lifting, you know, I got some good advice for some power lifters and I stuck to mostly barbells, mostly barbells all the time. Didn't do lots of dumbbells. Also because I would work out at home a lot and my gym set at home was the dumbbells were the adjustable ones, which kind of pain in the ass or whatever. So I do laterals and stuff like that and curls, but I didn't do a lot of chest presses and overhead presses. It was always with barbells. I remember doing lifts in the gym and I'd get the dumbbells up and I'd be able to get one up, but I couldn't get the other one up mm -hmm. with the first rep. Or if I started to fail, the form was way off and you couldn't tell with the barbell, but with the dumbbell, you totally could tell. That was when I first got that, oh crap, like there's a difference. Well, mine wasn't very visibly obvious until I actually got injured. Uh, and this was later in my career for football and my tore my MCL. And uh, I just didn't have that kind of stability and control anymore uh, surrounding the knee, which then on that side, in on particular. my right side. Yeah. So everything compensated, hyper comp compensated as a result of that. Uh, which then affected the way that I was explosive off my first step. I couldn't jump as well on my right leg. You know, I just these little subtle compensations over time really added up to where it went all the way up into my hips. And mm. then you'd see uh, my hips shift when I would squat and then it would create back problems. And so it was really one of those things that just was sort of, I didn't address it in the correct way. And then it was something I was always battling until I finally figured it out later. I'm glad glad you brought that up because this is probably what was more common as a trainer to see like with clients. Um, and I remember too, like after I'd seen this enough times and I got really good at, at, at pointing it out, uh, it was, you know, you would always impress clients by doing like an assessment with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, co a common uh, deviation you see is like a, like an asymmetrical shift, like you're kind of referring to. So somebody who will, when they squat down, their hips shift over to one side more than the other. M more often than not, when you have somebody, especially with a very dramatic one like that, at some point in their life, they had a an injury on their either knee, hip, ankle, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. something on that left le left side of their lower body that when they rehab and came back to training, the they didn't realize, but subconsciously, the the brain was like timid to put all the weight and force on the side that had been injured. So naturally the body kind of shifts away and says like, oh, I'm not sure we're ready for that. And what happens is it's so subtle when you first do it. This is why too, I'm like, I'm, I'm very critical of physical therapists that don't help clients see this from the very beginning because you start to build these bad patterns. And then now this person, when they squat kind of for the rest of their life, you end up strengthening it. Yeah they, yeah. they end up strengthening that other side and then it just becomes natural for them to shift and it's all subconscious and they don't even realize it until they have somebody uh, assess them like a trainer. Yeah, so, so rehab is like getting the full range of motion back and getting some stability and stuff. But full rehab really is getting it back to it's where it was before and to mirror the other side because a small difference turns into one that you end up strengthening over time. What you train, you make stronger. So if you're training with a slight difference, you end up strengthening that difference over time. And this is why past injuries 10 years ago, now that they're healed, everything's fine, but now I have this one muscle or this area that doesn't seem to seem to match. Now, just to sell this a little harder for people watching right now who really don't care too much about you know function and performance, although you should, um, visually speaking, it just means you don't look as good as you could because some muscles develop well, others don't, and you have mm -hmm. this kind of imbalance, and you're trying to pick up you know trying to pick up these weak areas, and why doesn't this muscle develop like these other muscles, and what's going on? I'm training it, but it's just not developing. And I know we've done episodes on it before, but 
Uh, I, I think we're going to get a little deeper into this one and how you can really balance things out, how you can really improve that symmetry and balance for the most aesthetic version of yourself, but also the best performing version of yourself because it gets in the way big time. What would you say uh, in your time competing, Adam, would, would be some of those muscle groups that, um, you know, people struggled with, you know, having a lagging uh, body part? Uh, well, calves are always, calves, calves yeah. are very normal because they're, you, they have poor connections uh, to calves. Uh, chest is actually very common. Um, in fact, uh, and that's both in co the competitive world and then just general population. Uh, fire Learning to fire the chest properly, like the bi biomechanics in the chest, is not a very natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like we just, when you when you tell someone, if you were to be, stand up and just tell someone to shove you, they don't. They don't think to retract, depress shoulders, and then shove yeah, yeah, yeah. and really engage the chest, which they should because they'll get more power that way. And by the way, somebody who is really good at that, like your and football players that train bench pressing like that, that's where a lot of that power is. They have ability to set themselves in that position to do that. The average person, they they don't. They just they naturally mm. roll and push forward. So you would still see that even in the competitive world. So some people have really underdeveloped chest, overdeveloped shoulders, or and what also contributes to the imbalance in the arms. Then they have these like massive triceps. So massive triceps and delts, but then like a, a like a, a flatter chest. Um, I mean, I've seen everything. I've seen every every muscle group and every individual is different because mm -hmm. if you've had injuries or you've had if you've had um, you know and I hate, I hate saying bad posture, but, you know, poor or less favorable posture for developing muscles evenly, uh, then you, and everyone could be different where that yeah. is, everything from top to bottom. Totally. So let's talk about um, the, I guess, the steps to addressing this and to really developing better symmetry and balance in your body. Now, we have to start with something that has nothing to do with training and has everything to do with diet, um, which is you need to be able to eat to build. Now, why are we starting here? Because- your, how you train, the signal that you send doesn't matter if your body doesn't have the building blocks to do so. Because developing symmetry is essentially developing muscle and strength uh, in a symmetrical way or in a way that improves your symmetry. But at the, at the core of it, it's building. And without those building blocks, if your metabolism is hammered, if you've dieted your body over and over again over time to the point where you're, you, know, you gain weight on eating very little calories... It's going to be really hard to do this because your body is just, it's, your metabolism becomes so efficient and it's scared to make itself burn more calories. So the first step is to eat to build or at, or if you have one of those metabolisms where you've just hammered it, reverse diet so that you can get your body in the position to build. Because if you don't do this, all the training and all the exercise and all the you know, the, the activation of muscles and strengthening isn't going to work. It's not going to do anything without well, that, that happening. Well, when you're, when you're saying, when you're, when we're building symmetry, you're building muscle in order to build muscle, you need to be in a calorie surplus. It's just that simple. And if, so if you are catabolic, uh, you, the meaning that we're, we're breaking down, yeah. uh, and the goal is to build muscle. So we we have more symmetry, more balance, uh, they're just conflicting signals. Mm -hmm. So I think getting yourself in a, getting your metabolism in a healthy place or uh, I eat being in a caloric surplus uh, is just ideal if this is the, the desired outcome. Yeah. Now reverse dieting, there's a lot that goes to it too much for this episode. We've actually done individual episodes on this particular topic. So I'll make sure that we try to link it uh, in the show notes. If you want a little bit more depth, we also have an ebook on reverse dieting that kind of breaks down, you know, what to do where you can learn how to reverse diet, but to give you kind of the gist of it, Essentially, what you would do is you would find out what your maintenance calories are. So however many calories you eat to maintain your body. And then what you do is you slowly increase those calories over time. So it could be as little as adding 50 calories to your maintenance or as high as eating three or 400 calories or maybe even 500 calories to your maintenance. And you do this over a weekly basis. So not like daily, not like you add 500 today and then another 500 tomorrow, but you would add, let's say, 100 calories to your maintenance this week. And then you're doing your training and you're seeing favorable results and you're building strength. And if you don't gain any weight or you don't gain lots of weight, then the next week you add another 100 calories. It's a slow increase of calories over time, which fuels and feeds the Give body. The building blocks. Builds muscle, speeds up your metabolism. It speeds your metabolism up. A successful reverse diet will result in some muscle gain without any fat loss or little, excuse me, without any fat gain or very, very little fat gain. Okay. And this depends on the individual and how bad, or I should say slow the metabolism is, but that's in a nutshell, what reverse dieting would do. So anytime you're trying to build 
anything, performance, strength, or muscle, or if you're trying to speed the metabolism up, this has to be the foundation because without this, then the body doesn't have the the fuel that it needs. So, I mean, that's the foundation for nutrition. Obviously, I think that's important that you at least address that or cover that. But the thing I'm most excited to talk about is the the foundation of what training should look like yes. for somebody like that's this. That's the fun stuff. Yep. And this was something that I, I, I didn't have this tool until later on. Like, I didn't understand um, how to use isometrics. Oh, yeah. Uh, for somebody like this, and God, uh, I know I would have been able to help so many more people had I had I utilized this more uh, because there were so many pl- so many practical places for me to use it for clients, and I just didn't know how to apply it. And to me, when you're talking about getting a muscle to fire, working on symmetry and balance, also preventing risk or pot- other potential mm-hmm. injuries. I don't think there is a better way than to start with laying a foundation with isometrics. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It's like I could go back in time and like work with some of these clients that really struggled with a lot of uh, poor connection issues or discrepancies from right to left. It's, you know, in terms of like slowing down and all that, like I was great at that. But like knowing that isometrics is the most effective way to build strength, like the quickest way possible and to get that hyper connection um, to the muscles and, and really hone in on that recruitment process. I mean, there's really no better method. So to apply that, uh, you know, in the very beginning to to be able to establish that strong connection again, uh, it's so much better to build off. Yeah. So I'm going to back up a little bit, right? So um, just kind of explain if you don't know what isometrics are. An isometric is a muscle contraction where you're not moving forward or back. You're not contracting and you're not relaxing. In other words, if I just flex my bicep, that's an isometric contraction. If I curl my bicep, that's a concentric contraction. If I contraction lower- without movement. Yeah, if I lower a weight with control, that's a, the eccentric contraction. So isometrics would be like me pushing against the wall. It's not moving. My body's not moving. Nothing's moving, but I'm pushing as hard as I can versus a bench press, which would- where the weight would move. Now, Justin said something, and he said it quickly, and I, I want to emphasize this. He said it's the fastest way to gain strength. Okay, this is true. Look up the studies on strength gain. Isometric training, the strength gains you get with isometric training happen faster, faster. It's furiously fast in comparison to concentric or eccentric training. Okay, so the question is, why doesn't everybody just do isometrics? Well, there's a, a caveat here. The gains happen very quickly, but then they plateau very quickly. Right. But there's something there that we can use. In other words, we can use isometrics to connect to muscles, fire more muscle fibers, and kickstart uh, weaker muscle groups it's or the muscle kindling groups. kindling to the fire. It is. And, and so here's there's some interesting, there's some very sad stories in the world of fitness. I'm going to start with one that has nothing to do with this just to illustrate my point. Barbell squats, deadlifts were a staple of strength training for a long time. Bodybuilders and strength athletes were like, these are the best exercises. They build so much strength. Then they fell out of favor. They fell out of say they fell out of favor so bad that when I was a trainer in the late 90s, in a gym, in a big gym, I'm, I'm talking about 30,000, 40,000 square foot, or even 50,000 square foot gyms. Some of these I grand opened myself. I would have one squat rack, and the squat rack would have dust on it. Nobody would use it. Now it's come full circle because that old wisdom has been relearned and people have said, oh my God, these are ex- exceptionally effective exercises. Why the hell did we throw these out? Okay, there's another sad story and it has to do with isometrics. In the early days of strength training, isometrics was a staple. Strong men, strength athletes, isometrics was a foundational, fundamental part of their training. If you look at Soviet era champion weightlifters. Now, this is during the period where the Soviet Union was d- not just winning gold medals in weightlifting. They were crushing the Dominating. world. And we couldn't figure it out. By the way, when Soviet Union uh, fell apart, a lot of the coaches came over here and went to other parts of the world and everybody learned their secrets. And part of it was utilizing isometrics. Now, there were other things as well, but isometrics was a big part of it. It's exceptionally effective. And for some reason, fell out of favor. Why? You can't build machines around isometrics too much. It maybe doesn't look as sexy. Maybe it requires more coaching. It's totally not sexy. You yeah. don't you need very little. Yeah, <laughs> you you need true. a wall, a floor. You don't need you don't need a fancy or equipment, a bar dumbbells. That's fixed. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. really don't need anything. That I really think that's the reason why it fell out yeah. of favor. Was it just uh, when the you know you start getting in the 50s, 60s and 70s and and this is where like marketing like yes. really started to happen and there's there's nothing sexy and sellable about yeah. it. So it's like 
Well, I, I really believe that's why it fell out because anybody who's been training for a really long time understands some of these principles. Yes. It's just not popular and, for and general population. they don't know how to program it. It's right. like, where, do I put, is, where do I put this in my workout? That's because nobody's done it. So exactly. like, find me an isometrics you know, uh, programmed workout. Good luck. You're not going to find one, right? Yeah. Now, you know, here's another thing about isometrics. Isometric contractions, intense ones, activate more muscle fibers than the other contractions do in a big way. Now you think, why? Why, is that, why does that happen? Because when you're pushing against an immovable object, your body will recruit muscle fibers and then nothing happens. Uh-oh, we're not moving the object. Recruit more. Yeah. Uh-oh, nothing's happening. Ratchet it up. Recruit Ratchet more. You recruit more muscle fibers with isometric contractions far more than you do with concentric and eccentric, even at, at very high intensities. So knowing the strength gains happen quick, they require very little equipment. There's no movement, okay, required in isometric contraction, and it activates the most muscle fibers. Talk about the best way to activate muscles that may be weaker than others or activate muscles that may be weak links for you. There is no better method. Yeah. If you want to activate your glutes because they don't develop when you do well, squats, isometrics. You want to activate your chest because it's not developing like your shoulders and triceps, isometrics. It's a phenomenal training method that nobody uses ever ever and so it's this is something that's very this is what this is one of the answers to this problem and in terms of programming start your workouts off with them or do entire cycles i suggest people try a two or three week cycle of isometric training and then go back to your training and see what happens well and if you think about just exercises in general you need a specific amount of force to be able to get that initial lift off mm -hmm. and then the rest you don't really need to use quite as much uh muscle uh recruitment and force behind it so uh, with isometrics like you're you're just stuck in that first part recruiting and then you gotta and you it's pretty much endless with how much uh, effort and force you can produce uh, within well, that. Well, you, you get, that's why you get strong so quickly because your yeah, CNS I, learns how to ramp up. I want to defend some people because I do, there there are some people that use isometrics. They just don't know that how they're using them or really why they're using them. I saw it was common in bodybuilding. Oh, posing. Yeah. Practicing. There's, yeah. A, there's actually a lot of bodybuilding routines that encourage the bodybuilders to like flex, flex and pose sets. between <laughs> sets and things. Yeah. And so they don't even know that they don't. Like and I, you know, it ends up turning into more of like a visual thing of looking at yourself yeah. and, and, and totally. getting better at pr presenting your muscles. But there's actually real benefit there when it comes to getting better connectivity to those m muscles and you're because you're doing an isometric contraction when you do that. I tell you what, if you have a weak body part, a stubborn body part, it's probably a body part. You also have a tough time flexing really hard. Yep. Okay. Just to give you an example, an illustration of what I'm talking about. Now, there's much more. Obviously, we could go into, we could have entire episode talking about how to incorporate isometrics, isometric exercise, all that stuff. We've done some videos on some isometric stuff on Mind Pump TV channel that's on YouTube. So maybe we'll link a couple. We also have an ebook on isometrics that kind of breaks down the history and how to incorporate and whatnot. But nonetheless, just know that when it comes to building symmetry, turning on muscles that don't fire as well. It's a foundation. You utilize isometrics, especially in the beginning of your training. Uh, it makes a, a huge difference. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to move to the more obvious stuff. Yeah. If my right and my left aren't balanced out, or if I want to train them in a way where I can start to see if there's imbalances, because sometimes they're hard to see, one of the best ways you could do is with unilateral training. Unilateral training is exceptional at doing this. Okay, so unilateral training means instead of doing both arms or both legs... I'm doing one arm or one leg at a time. Back to bodybuilders, Adam. Bodybuilders are so concerned with training and developing a balanced symmetrical physique because they get judged so heavily on it. They do an exceptional amount of unilateral exercises, mm -hmm. more than any strength athlete. In fact, most strength athletes do very little unless they're doing rehab or their coaches are really smart and they see imbalances. But bodybuilders love doing – they'll even do curls – one arm at a time, right? To, because they know that they can connect more, get a better pump and that kind of stuff. I, I don't think this is actually as obvious as you, you just alluded to. Uh, I think that when, when I, at least not in the general population, like when I'd have a client that had an imbalance like that and, and like maybe I picked them up after they had already attempted to do themselves, 
kind of the 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 common theme or the most common thing I would see is people would just do more work on that weaker side. Yeah, that's that's true. So that that's, that, the that's wrong kind approach. Of, yeah, it's not it's their their approach to it is is not like oh I'm going to do unilateral training now going forward. I'm going to start with the weaker side until it catches up. Yeah. There's this idea like oh my left side's really weak, so I'm just going to do more work. With my left side, and then all they end up doing is getting overtrained on that side, and they never really balance uh, their body out. So I, I actually don't think it's as obvious as you think it is. I think most people need to be kind of told, like, okay, what exactly is unilateral training? Why do we? Why would we use it for this? And then also, uh, how do we do it? Because there's also a, a wrong and a right way to do unilateral training when you have lagging body parts. Yeah, you're right. So just doing more work for a lagging body part that could be part of the formula. But if there's a poor connection and poor recruitment pattern. Uh, it's not going to make that big of a difference, right? So you got to get those things first. So with unilateral training, essentially like, uh, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So like if I did a dumbbell chest press, if I push both dumbbells at the same time, there's a unilateral component, but it's not really considered unilateral training until I'm just doing one arm at a time. And there's a couple different ways to do this. One way would be to support one dumbbell with an isometric contraction at the bottom. So I'm not resting it on my body. I'm actually supporting it while the other one presses and then I alternate or holding it at the top with an isometric contraction while one presses. And then another level would be no dumbbell on one side, right. stabilizing my body and doing one dumbbell and pressing. So those are all different types of unilateral training. And the key here, this is very important, is to allow the weak or lagging side to dictate the weight and the reps. So that means your stronger side is going to be doing an easier workout. Now, why would we do an easier workout on the stronger side? Because if we allow the stronger side to dictate, which is what everybody does, think about it. The few unilateral exercises that people do, like a dumbbell row, that's a common one. Everybody does a dumbbell row. Which side do you always start with? They always almost, start with the strong, strong side. Almost always the strong side. And that ends up dictating how many reps you do with the other side. So what ends up happening is I do 10 reps with my right stronger arm. My left arm, I get to nine. The 10th one, the form is a little off because I got to do 10 reps because my strong side did 10 reps. In reality, what it should have been, I start with my left side, only can do nine reps of perfect form. Now I just stop at nine reps with the other arm. And what it does is, because what happens if you train with the high intensity with the stronger side, they both might get stronger, but you maintain the gap of asymmetry, right? Yeah. The right goes up and the left goes up, but they maintain the gap. What we're trying to do is slow down the development of the stronger side and speed up the development of the weaker side to get them to match so you develop symmetry. Well, and back to the original kind of uh, conversation in the beginning where we we're talking about barbell trains, very, very difficult to see uh, the discrepancies from right to left yep. if you're not unilateral training. And there is, you know, a bit of uh, thought out there that you can correct form and then it's sort of going to take care of itself eventually uh, if you just get better at the technique and um, without actually addressing your right to left side discrepancy. So this is one of those things where, you know, I differ in that train of thought. I, I really feel strongly that, you know, focusing on uh, exposing, uh, you know, any kind of like imbalance or strength discrepancy from right to left should be addressed and it's going to benefit you even longer term than the other approach. The key, the next key is you kind of alluded to it, Sal, and I think it's so important is the um is that you control and you, like this is a when you're training like this this is a, if it was ever really it's always important but if it was ever extremely important right like to not like push the weight and try and max lift or train to failure like this is where I want my clients to really back off the weight and you know when you're doing that weaker side right when we're training unilateral I'm 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 watching the form and the minute form starts to break down we are cutting it off so you re you said you do nine well it's nine perfect yes. right like if you could have squeezed out 10 or 11 we're not doing 10 or 11 on that weaker side those we're doing, two shitty reps are going to make that, things worse that, that's right we're going to do nine perfect and the, the the minute i can feel that that perfect pattern or form is is coming it's breaking down i shut down and then the other side the dominant side yeah. matches yeah. that so the control Here, and form is everything that's how you kill bad habits yeah. yeah here's a tip uh that i was going to say is you want to create not just perfect form mirror form what does that mean that means if you saw me with my right arm it should be a mirror of my left arm or vice versa when I'm doing the lift. So another tip is you could record yourself doing certain exercises because you may feel, and I've done this to myself and it was actually quite uh, illuminating. 
I felt like my right and left were equal and they felt eh, pretty similar in strength and form recorded myself. And I noticed that my left shoulder literally I mean, it was up mm -hmm. by maybe a quarter inch higher than my right. And I literally, I watched it. I, I drew a line in the middle and I looked and I'm like, holy cow, it's off by just a tiny bit. So what you want is you want to create mirror form and you have to do exceptionally controlled form in order to do that. Momentum is the enemy of symmetry. Okay. It's the enemy of symmetry training because it, it, and it's sometimes it's so subconscious. You don't even notice the slightest bit of momentum. Think about it this way. Most people don't have, there's definitely people watching who have glaring asymmetry issues, right? They're like, oh yeah, there's a huge difference between my right and leg. And oh yeah, my hips really move to the right. And when I bench press, I notice the bar really twisting. Most people are not like that though. Most people have a 3% or 4% asymmetry. You're not going to be able to tell very easily with that. It's not super easy to see that, but is it, is it, does it have an impact on your symmetry in terms of how you look? It will, especially over the years. Does it have an impact on your performance? It definitely will. So you want to watch, make sure it's mirror form and have everything controlled and perfect so that you can make up the difference. And you'll, you can see that with the unilateral training. You tend to be able to see that with unilateral training and especially in how it feels. And there's one more thing I want to comment on, which is really interesting. Look at the amount of weight you can lift with both arms. Look at the amount of weight you can lift with one arm. First off, it's never half that amount. And there's, that's understandable. Like if you could deadlift 400 pounds or let's say you could press 200 pounds, you're not gonna be able to press 100 with one hand usually. Usually there's it's less than that, but it shouldn't be a uh, way less. Like you shouldn't be able to overhead press 200 pounds, but only overhead press 30, 30 pound dumbbells for the same amount of reps. That's a very big difference. And so what happens when you train unilaterally and you bring that up, what do you think happens to your bilateral lifting? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it goes to the roof. This is one of the greatest, one of the best ways to uh, get through sticking points is to get stronger in the unilateral stuff and then go back to your bilateral, meaning both arms or both legs. And it's like a whole nother level of stability and strength. Well, and it's, it's a psychological discipline going in because you got to have the right intent going in. I, th I think a lot of people get deterred by this style of training because they think they're regressing. Like I, now I'm coming back, I'm, I'm using less weight. Uh, and, and it's, it's a frustration mm -hmm. element in there that you really have to overcome. Uh, when in fact it's going to benefit you the most to, to really, but, but it, you have to make sure you check yourself coming in with the right intent and to really, you know, do the appropriate amount of weight and start with the weaker side and, and be very intentional about your form. To add to that, slow the tempo yes. down. Uh, I, I talk about this on the show all the time that rarely ever do we see anybody doing a true four second negative or eccentric portion of the exercise at least that, you know? I mean, it's like this, right? So if I did a press, right, it'd be one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Like that looks ridiculously slow because nobody does that. Yeah. But that's what we're talking about. And it can even be slower. I mean, that's when I'm talking to a client that I'm training this way, that we're trying to balance things out. Um, I am not concerned at all about it being week two or three or four. And we haven't moved up five or 10 pounds on the, on the, you know, dumbbell, right? Like it's, I care more about how perfect is that left side looking to the right side? And that, I, and the way I do that is by cutting the weight way yeah. down, slowing the tempo down, and putting so much emphasis on that. On uh, like you said, the mir mirroring the other side, that is way more of a win than if we just added five or yes, ten more look, pounds. Okay, here's here's an, here's another just to hammer it home. Okay, your body is does an exceptional job at learning how to be most efficient with the tools that it's given. Okay, so. If I have a torn soleus muscle, which is one of my calf muscles, uh, my body's going to run in a way that makes me the fastest considering I have a torn soleus. And that becomes my, my new pattern. Okay. To use another example that people might understand, if you type with your two index fingers, right, you never learned how to type and you got pretty fast with it. And then you're like, you know what? I know that if I learn how to type properly, I'll eventually be way faster than I am now with my two index fingers. And then you got trained on it, but instead of training you on slowing down and learning how to type, they still gave you a limit. No, you gotta be as fast as you were before. You'll never learn. You'll always revert back to your old pattern because that's your fast pattern. So what happens when you don't go slow is you go back to your old pattern and you don't realize it. Your body recruits the way it always does. It moves in the most efficient way possible. So you have to slow way down. You have to go lighter yeah. in order to 
change the recruitment pattern because the second you go outside of that and goes too fast. You have to be conscious, not subconscious. Super, so, super conscious. It's yeah. really, really hard. Now, once you you do that and then you strengthen that, guess what? That becomes your new pattern because that is a more efficient because your body will choose to move symmetrically so long it has the strength to do so. But first you have to build that strength. And then now is the time where we go to bilateral training. And now we try and see how it's expressing itself. So That's when you, then you go back to your bilateral and then you're blown away. Like did, you've done a cycle, right? Where you did like single leg deadlifts for a while and then oh, back yeah. to your normal deadlift. Incredible. And, and that's, and by the way, when you do this, uh, you know, go back to bilateral training. I'm not trying to think of, oh, what was the greatest PR ever did? It's like, I want to think about how I feel going into the movement. And one of the things that you will notice when you've trained unilateral for a, an extended period of time, right, for a full like cycle, and then you come back to bilateral training is how stable you feel. Yes. You just feel so on your leg exercise, you feel so grounded for your upper body exercise. You feel in such control and you can generate more power, especially when you've done it right and you've included isometrics in there. I mean, it's so good. And I feel like so few people actually run through like a full cycle of this where they're incorporating isometrics, unilateral training, stick to it consistently, avoid the bilateral stuff for yep. a while. And then after you've ran a few months of training this way, okay, now let's go see if I go to do my bilateral movements, if I can actually feel my yeah. body expressing that movement. Now I can spread different. and distribute the load, uh, you know, towards that other side a bit more. Think about how much uh, more strength that's going to apply to your overall amount. Yeah, right? I did that for, I mean, if you listen to the podcast for the last year, you know this. I stopped barbell squatting because I was developing, it, was an, it became an obvious uh, discrepancy that wasn't so obvious until it got too bad. And I had to stop barbell squatting. And all I did were all unilateral stuff. So I did d different versions of lunges, Bulgarian split stat squats, single leg deadlifts. I did uh, single leg squats. And I did them for, I don't know, how long was it that I did that? Like four months, five months of just pure for lower body unilateral training. The only thing I did that, well, it's not even bilateral. I did sled work, which is, can be considered uh, unilateral to some extent, right? So I did that, went back to squatting. Here's the crazy thing lost no strength, and then broke past my old plateaus. So what I was stuck at like squatting with 335 to 350, but then it would hurt. I got up to 405 within two months after doing just unilateral training. Why? Because I, I solved all those problems. I felt so much stable and so much stronger. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, after you're done with a cycle of unilateral training, go back to your heavy barbell you know, five by five type program, your barbell type based routines, go back to something like that. Watch what happens because not only did you not lose strength, you'll feel more stable, but then the strength gains come on real fast because you don't have the things that are holding you back that you had before you've kind of solved those things. And then the last step is this, repeat the cycle. This is a wonderful cycle of Because then you can stick to the bilateral training. Eventually, you'll start to develop maybe some imbalances. Then you go back and you re repeat the cycle again. You get this kind of nice perpetual motion of progress and balance. And then what you develop is this really beautiful, aesthetic, balanced physique without weak body parts, without that moves well. imbalances. That moves and feels uh, really well. Now, here's the thing, right? Unilateral training I, we have yet to find a very well-programmed workout program that incorporates unilateral training, okay? Mm -hmm. It's usually thrown in to programs as single exercises or maybe three or four exercises, but not like as the focus, right? Not as the focus of balancing the body out. So, And it can be a bit complex. We've talked on the show about programming and all the things that go into programming and exercise order and reps and how to place the right things where. So uh, that can that can be quite complex. Right? I mean, it was one of the number one things that, I mean, that we've we've needed to address for a while. When we started doing the live Q and A's. We're like constantly trying to recommend unilateral training, but we didn't have yeah. anybody to I, I don't know how many times them. we'd have to say that to somebody. Well, what you should do is regress back down, switch to unilateral yeah. training for a while. And people and, are like, how do I program that? Yeah. So I think this has been um, a need for quite some time. Yeah. So sure. what we did, if you want it all uh, put together for you, and we haven't launched a new MAPS program in a long time, definitely not one that caters to our core like fitness fanatic uh, audience. What we've done is we created a brand new MAPS program called MAPS Symmetry, 
which incorporates these unilateral training cycles. It's got isometric phase in it because that's obviously very important. It also takes and borrows some of the, the value that you get from MAPS Anabolic. It's got trigger sessions in some of the phases. It's got mobility sessions that you find in MAPS Performance in some of the phases. And it has focus sessions for MAPS Aesthetic in some of the phases. It's a four-phase program. It's a long program because this is the type of results you get with a, with a unilateral-based, symmetry-based program. They last for a long time. You can keep pushing it and keep getting uh, success and results. By the way, the last phase of this program is a five by five programmed bilateral barbell based workout. So you at the very show end, off all the hard work going in. At the very end, that's what you uh, end up feeling. Now, there's more. Okay, so we talked about because this was a big deal. We talked about this and said we want to set people up really well. That's when the conversation came up about feeding the body properly. That's been an issue in the past. We've had people comment and say, Hey, I'm following your program. I don't know what's happening. Most more often than not, it's, it's women. And then we'll ask them quiet questions about their diet. We're like, okay, you're not feeding yourself properly. So we have a, I said earlier, a reverse dieting ebook that is going to be included in the launch of maps, uh, symmetry. We also have a isometrics ebook that we're selling separately, but we're including it with the launch of map symmetry. This is the official launch. Map Symmetry is going to retail for $177, but we're launching it right now at $97, which means you get full access to Map Symmetry, plus you get the free reverse dieting 101 ebook and the free isometric. Which are legit books, e-book. by the way. They're not just like a list of of items. This is a very comprehensive book. No, oh, no after launch, we're gonna we'll sell it. Like- yeah, they'll be so just so you know, Map Symmetry will be retailing at 177. The uh, reverse dieting 101 ebook will be $47. And the isometrics ebook will be $47. But right now you get the map symmetry, isometrics ebook, reverse dieting 101. All of that is going to be $97, which is going to be the, 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 the launch. And the launch, Doug, when does it end? 17th. 17th. Okay. Yeah, so Sunday night. So it's going to be essentially, uh, I think, this week. a week, right? Yeah, yeah. So on the 17th, this particular launch will end, and then everything goes back up to retail. Now, if you don't want to buy a program, we do have show notes with other episodes and videos that can definitely help you. It's just going to take you a little time to put things together and kind of program it for yourself. But if you want to follow a comprehensive workout where it's all in there, so we have the video demos, the exercises, um, there's coaching. So I, do, I give you some coaching, tell you how to replace certain exercises if you only have a home gym. Uh, I talk about tempo and you know how to how to make muscles fire better and all that stuff. That's all included in this. Okay, so the website for all of this is mapssymmetry.com. So there's two S's, M A P S, and then S again for symmetry. So mapssymmetry.com, and the code for all of this, the free eBooks and the discount is S Y M fifty. So S Y M five zero. And you get that uh, all hooked up. And then, of course, uh, all of our programs come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you do this, you sign up, you're, uh, it's not for me, just return it and you get all, all of your money back 100% with no questions asked. So there you have it. Uh, look, if you want to learn more about the information that we give out for free, you can go to mindpumpfree.com. And if you want to find us on social media, you can find Justin on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.com. 